Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. We are privileged to have Carla Fogarin, who is the System Director of Diversity Initiatives at Stewart Healthcare and a board member of National Council of Interpreters in Healthcare with us today. Carla, thank you for joining us. It's my absolute pleasure. Thank you. We wanted to ask you a few questions and see if you can share the experience with us that you have learned uh, working during the, the COVID initial outbreak. And uh, wanted to ask you, what are some of the lessons learned and what would you suggest organizations put in place to ensure better preparation and language access? Well, for me, I was very, very fortunate um, to, I mean, let's talk about this new normal, right? What's normal about having to get up in the morning, dress yourself for battle in order to go work at a hospital? What's normal about not being able to hug your grandson? What's normal about not being able to be with your mom at a deathbed in a hospital? None of this is really normal. It's just our reality, right? And I think it's going to eventually become the norm, right? But for me, when, when uh, this presented, it, it was an incredible challenge. But luckily enough, I had an emergency disaster language access plan in place. Uh, of course, it didn't speak to the pandemic. I mean, think about it. Who could have imagined this, right? But, you know, I would advise folks to really think about worst case scenario, like a survival guide. What do you do when the power goes out, right? When the lights go out, how do you serve patients? So having an emergency disaster plan in place, having all three modalities of interpreting services available, I cannot stress that enough. So many of us are resistant to video and telephonic interpreting, and we almost feel like it's gonna take away our livelihood. It's gonna replace the essence and the core of who we are as interpreters, and quite the opposite. You know, it supplements us, it, it, it feeds us, right? So for those hospitals like Stewart Healthcare that in essence had all three modalities, we have in-person interpreters, we have video conference center uh, of our own, we have a telephone call center of our own. Honestly, I, I almost had to pinch myself because I, I couldn't have prepared myself better for that. But best uh, thing that I have, the biggest asset that I have is an incredibly talented team of managers and qualified interpreters. So you can't have anything without having that uh, continued growth of your interpreter department, right? Um, so for me, the calls that I got from across the country from colleagues was more like, what do I do now? Because most people don't have an emergency disaster plan. Invite yourself to the emergency disaster committee planning teams. This happens year long. Find a seat at the table because when a disaster happens, whether it's a hurricane or whether it's an earthquake or a fire, guess what? LEP patients and patients who are deaf are going to require services as well. And they're going to be the ones that are most uh, marginalized, right? Because they're not going to receive the information at the same time that the English speakers or those that can hear are receiving it. So being prepared but I understand that you still had to come up with some creative new solutions on the spot to be able to react. What were some of those uh, new innovative things you had to put well, in place? In all, in all honesty, I lost a lot of sleep uh, on this because on March 13th, I had to make a decision about my staff. Do I put them in harm's way? Do I have them go do in-person interpreting? I think most of us that are leaders in language access struggled with that. Never mind leaders at the hospital level, everybody struggled with that. And some decided that they would only do remote. For us, we decided that we would do all three. So no one worked from home, everybody worked from the hospital. And what we did was we informed the clinical staff that we were going to cut back some of our in-person interpreting. For instance, we weren't gonna do rounds that would require us to waste PPE when it wasn't necessary. Anything that could be done by phone or video, like a menu or anything like that, we would do by phone and video. But we assured the clinical staff that we were there for them, that we would come up. If they needed us, we would be there. I got the team all the PPE, just like any other clinical team member had. And then I had to start thinking, well, okay, I don't have coverage 24-7. We started moving our teams 24-7 so that we had coverage. Because in all honesty, these patients are not your typical patients. 
these patients are extremely, extremely sick in a room with a bunch of people with masks on, fans blowing for negative pressure, machines beeping uh, you know, all over the place. An iPad or a phone is not gonna be the solution when it takes such an effort for them to even whisper. So I mean, interpreters had to down up and they had to go in and be part of that process. Now we were told to try to remain six feet away when possible. Well, you can't hear that whisper. It's extremely hard. So we came up with a creative solution. We have something in place called the pocket talker, which is an amplification system for patients who are hard of hearing. Usually the patient wears the headset, and I actually have one here to show you. Usually the patient wears the headset, and it reduces the white noise in the background, and it amplifies just what they need to hear. We reverse that. We have the interpreters wear the headset, and place the microphone on a nine, it's got a nine foot long extension near the patient so that we wouldn't have to literally put our ear to the patient's lips to be able to hear them. And on several instances that helped us greatly. So that was one of the innovative things we did. You know, we moved staff 24 seven, we filled out every one of our call centers by phone and video, and we had uh, employees, interpreters that would dispatch in person. And by the way, it wasn't like you could choose, I'll go in person, I'll stay, uh, I'll only do video. All of my team stepped up and they did whatever was required from them. Were they scared? Absolutely. Were they nervous? Yes. So, you know, communication was my key thing. You have to communicate with your team and with the clinical staff, right? Um, and we did that several times. We're here for you we would round on a COVID unit and say, I know you have three patients that speak Portuguese or Spanish. Do you need us to go in? Most of the time the nurses would say, no, not at this time, but you know what? For us, visibility, visibility, visibility is essential. They did, they're not gonna forget that we were there and willing to go in with them should they need us, right? Um, we had to get creative because everybody's wearing masks. So for patients who are hard of hearing, they can't see the lips, so they can't read lips. So we got clear communicator masks. Um, in March, I started ordering all this. If I could give people a piece of advice is that they have to understand that the, um, your supply chain is gonna be imploding because everybody's gonna want the same thing, right? So immediately upon assessing a need, you just have to act on it. Even if you end up with 15 boxes that you don't need, you have to act on it. So I was able to get some masks. I was able to get more amplifiers. I was just extremely lucky. I had 200 uh, dual handset phones that were old. We had two hospitals that were COVID only. So we were able to place these speaker phones in each patient's room so that we could eliminate the back and forth and we could really put it on speaker not having to hand things back and forth. We have 850 iPads throughout the system. We were just in a really good place. It was almost like the perfect storm for us. Um, but it wasn't easy and it's still not easy. You know, people are frankly exhausted, right? But I've, I've been very, very uh, pleased because Stuart has really tried to make sure that they've got as much PPE, as many vents as they can get their hands on and everything so that we remain safe while providing the best care possible. Do you see that? The COVID outbreak somehow changed the role of the interpreter during the encounter? Well, interesting. I'm not sure where this is going to end, okay? Um, so I don't think that it necessarily changed the role of qualified, trained, professional interpreters who know the standards of practice and their role, know when to advocate, when not to advocate. But I think what it did was it just raised the level of professionalism that we have. You know, none of my interpreters really knew how to put on PPE. Occasionally, we go into a TB room or something like that. You should have seen these doctors and nurses almost like uh, hovering over us, tying everything up for us, making sure that we had nothing exposed when we went in. They took such care of my interpreters because they were just so happy to have us step into the room with them. Um, I think if anything, one of my interpreters just gave me that aha uh -huh moment early on as she was talking to her colleagues who were all very nervous. She said, the patient is not the virus. The patient is sick with COVID. 
So it's more important for us, since they can't see our smile, to smile with our eyes and to have a warm tone and not to rush them. So that resonated with me because that is, in essence, the truth, right? Everybody was wearing masks. Even patients that didn't have COVID were asked to put masks on when we entered their room. Um, so not sure if it's going to change the role of the interpreter, but I will tell you that I've always struggled with this, and I think some of my colleagues across the country are struggling with it as well. You know, I, I've always, my background is that I'm a registered nurse, so I've always thought of our team as a clinical component of the clinical team, that we're part of a clinical team. We're essential workers. We have to report to work. We're needed. And um, when this started happening, it's like, well, you know, are we really, do we really have to be at, at, at the forefront of this? And the way I was thinking, I was thinking, well, how can I, how can we ask the nurse, the doctor, the phlebotomist, the respiratory therapist, the certified nursing assistant, and the environmental service person to go ahead and go in, but we are excused from it. So you've got to know who you are and stick to that. You're either part of the clinical team or you're not but you can't just be part of it when it's convenient. And I was lucky enough that my team actually feels like they're truly part of the clinical team. Um, and in, in all honesty, uh, in the intensive care units, um, we had interpreters in there for hours with patients uh, when they were intubated, when they were extubated, when they took their first step with the help of physical therapy. Um, so, for me, I don't see our role changing that much because it's always been kind of like a respected role here. But I think across the country from what I'm hearing, I think people have a much better understanding of what happens when communication does not take place because there's no one there to speak for the patient. Have you, so we have seen basically the interpreter take a bigger role or an equal role or, or recognized for the equal role in the care team. And uh, some of the uh, walls between the healthcare providers and the interpreters came, kind of broke down. They, they embraced the interpreters in a way and, and recognized them. You know, I haven't met a doctor or a nurse that has said to me, oh, this doesn't bother me. I'm not at all fearful about this, right? Um, I think knowing that everyone you know, the environmental services, first line of defense and the last line of defense, right? Going into a COVID room to turn it over and clean it up. I think everybody's such an essential component of the success of this, right? But, you know, it's true when, when bad things happen, usually the good rises in people, right? I think that interpreter services has played an incredible role in keeping the pandemic down. Uh, translations, um, you know, the whole gamut of things that we've done. But just an interesting sidebar, you know, if you're really part of the team, sometimes you end up doing things that are not really, quote, interpreter related, but you're doing it because it's a benefit to the whole clinical team and to the patient. As soon as this happened and they restricted all visiting, we had patients that were very frightened by themselves, um, away from their loved ones, and we repurposed some of our iPads, put them on carts, and created something called the virtual visit iPads. And we would actually have the nurses put in a request for us to come up with it, and we would connect with the family members. So we had a 94-year-old uh, patient who was able to see her great-grandson right after he was born. We had a, um, a, a young woman with uh, uh, Down syndrome who was hospitalized for the first time without her family, who was able to really connect with her family during that. We had a few cases where people were literally saying their goodbyes uh, through, imagine this, FaceTime, right? But the patients and their families were so incredibly grateful, incredibly grateful that we had this in place. Now, one would say, well, what's this got to do with interpreter services, right? We weren't just doing this for LEP patients or for patients who were deaf and their loved ones. We were doing it for anyone that needed it. And that's one of the things we're going to keep. We're going to keep that, uh, Nilla, because... We were even doing discharge teaching with that. So think about it. If your family members in the hospital and you have to go learn to transfer them out of bed or to give them insulin, you would have come to the hospital to learn that. But during the COVID, you couldn't. So we were actually teaching the family members so we could do a safe discharge. You know, so that's going to stay. 
because families are all over the world. So if somebody wants to see their loved one while they're in the hospital, why shouldn't we offer this extra benefit to the patients and continue to do so? So the things that you believe will stay are this expanded role of the interpreter who is uh, working at the hospital on a full-time basis, you know, as part of the healthcare organization. I think that more organizations are going to see it that way. If during the COVID you were present, if you weren't present, I have some concerns about that. Because, you know, it it's taken us decades. I mean, think about it, decades to get providers to really see us as a necessary component of the team, right? And we have said, listen, if there's an in-person interpreter here, you know, utilize us, right? Uh, we all know that in-person is better than video and phone in most cases, not in all cases, right? Um, so we don't want people regressing to, the, to bad habits, right? Not using an interpreter, using a family member, or just thinking that because it's a pandemic, oh, the civil rights laws don't apply, or the Joint Commission of the DNV regulations don't apply. We all know that it doesn't matter whether it's a pandemic or not. Those regulations are in place to protect patients and to protect us, right? So um, I see for those hospitals that had the ability to support their team, um, I see that this will be a very positive thing. I worry about some of the stories that I'm hearing from colleagues where, you know, can we do this by phone more? Can we do this by video more? Well, we did it during the COVID. Can we continue to do it more that way? You know, it's a struggle, right? And that's why I think that my best piece, my best advice would be, you know, stay the course, look into getting your own video call center. There are, uh, by the way, we could not have done any of this, uh, at least at Stewart, without our incredible team of vendor partners, okay? Um, so work with your vendor partners, ask them if they have the feasibility of uh, putting something in place where the calls can route to your interpreters first. And if your interpreters are occupied by being in person or otherwise occupied by video, then it routes to the vendor. There's enough for all parties to be able to serve in this capacity, right? Um, it takes a lot of work. It takes an incredible amount of work to set these programs up to train the staff. But imagine uh, every single one of my uh, 100 plus interpreters are trained in all three modalities. So to us, it was seamless. And some of them speak four languages and are qualified to interpret in four languages. So they could actually be sitting on a video call, have a Haitian call come in, take it, have a French call come in, take it, have a Spanish call come in, take it. You know? So um, that's the the drawback is like, if you're not prepared to be able to offer the different modalities, telehealth, for instance, right? We're all being pulled in to help with the telehealth because a large percentage of our patients are LEPs. So that presents different challenges. How do you do it, right? Uh, how do you provide a ASL interpreter on the screen while you're doing telehealth for a patient who's deaf? So we had to, like in the moment, adjust our sales to be able to do this. But I think all in all, um, you know, the most challenging thing was changing. Every second there was a change. We translated something, 15 minutes later, that was wrong. We needed to translate something else, right? Because the unknown factor of this virus constantly changing and us learning more and more, it was unbelievable, right? Uh, but I think that if nothing else, we will never, we will be much more prepared for anything like this that comes again. And chances are it will continue to happen, right? So, um, you know, the technology aspect scares people and I embrace technology. Interpreters who do not embrace technology are gonna lose the race. I've been saying that for years. I mean, we our interpreters have iPads of their own. We have a dispatching system called Service Up that's through a portal that the uh, requester enters it and within 30 seconds, the interpreter gets the request with everything they need to know to go to the assignment. Um, we decreased our wait time for an interpreter from 24.8 minutes to seven minutes by doing that. So we can do more cases, right? We've increased our team. We haven't decreased our staff, we've increased it. Um, you know, we, we've done the video capacity. Uh, without the technology, 
you're going to falter. Cardiac surgery five years ago is not what it is today. Thank God, right? So why should we stuck in the past? We've got to kind of develop with the progress and the technology uh, because there's so much opportunity for us as interpreters to be able to serve in the different capacities. That, that's very, very great point. And that's great advice for interpreters as well on what we can do as professionals to be able to respond better in times of crisis and be better prepared to, to serve uh, the, the patients and to enable language access. Thank you so much, Carla. Really appreciate your advice and really appreciate your time today. Uh, thank you for joining us and uh, uh, thank you. No, my pleasure. Thank you for having me.